Okay. So I would like to start. Good afternoon uh, to the audience. This is um, a joint event organized by the Institute um, for Banking and Financial History, IBF, and SAFE. And we will uh, have a webinar today that will feature Moritz Schularik, who is currently in New York, but the opportunity that this strange time uh, opens up for us is to have events and seminars and conferences that span the world, so to speak, that bring people from different parts of the world together. And so Moritz being in New York and we are being in Frankfurt is a good opportunity for a lively debate. Um, and I'm very happy, Moritz, that you accepted our invitation to talk today. Let me say a few words about uh, Moritz Schularik. He is a professor of economics at the University of Bonn and also a research professor at the NYU in New York. That's why he's currently visiting um, the epicenter of the uh, corona crisis, so to speak. He's also the director of the Macrofinance Lab in, in Bonn, and his main field is macrofinance uh, in an historical dimension. So he is one of the few people who does finance, macro, and all that in a setting that exploits the possibilities of long time series, of long observations. And that has made him one of the most prominent scholars in the field um, in, in the world today, because he has been addressing, I would say, the big issues of our times, had no fear to address the big issues of our times. And while many people stick to very small problems, he does not. And in, in times as, as those, as, as now, uh, I think this is particularly valuable if people get out of the, of the ground, so to speak, get a bit on an elevated post and look around and tell us what is really the, the, the big picture, the longer term picture. His, his work has been on, in, in many areas, I think very, um, uh, always leaving um, or bringing some path breaking contribution relating to these long series. He worked on house prices, on income and wealth. He worked on rates of return on all sorts of assets. Um, he worked on risk premium to name just a few, but the dimension of the long time of the long horizon um, often shows new insights that may get lost if you are too much uh, in a way now casting or doing analysis at, in a very uh, narrow range of years around the current uh, period. Uh, his work has got a lot of attention, not only been published in the best journals, but also um, uh, has been recognized by many institutions, both on the academic side as well as on the on the policy side, he, he won, won the Gossen Prize, won signal by German Economic Association for uh, people whose work has gained international recognition. That is uh, certainly true for his work. And uh, he has, is, a, is a person who's often heard at institutions like the ECB, for instance, um, who are of course particularly interested in these long-term macro views to which they, through their action, uh, contribute quite a bit. So, but I don't want to, uh, replace his lecture by another one on Mark Moritz Schollerich. So I, I hand over to him, but not without saying what he's talking about. Uh, he talks in, in a certain sense, uh, I, I don't know whether he does it directly or not, we will see, but he talks about one aspect that bears heavily on our mind today. Is we see the uh, developing crisis, we see governments stepping in uh, from all sides at the same time and we fear a big build-up of debt. We fear that there are costs coming. And of course, the question is, how costly is a crisis? And that's one of the big questions that people usually don't dare to ask, but Moritz does. Moritz, the floor is yours. Thank you for talking to us. Well, thank you, Jan, for the very complimentary introduction. I'm very happy to be a part of this and, and, and give this a webinar and have the conversation with you and, and our guests later on. 
Um, also because uh, SAFE is uh, this amazing new research institution and very proud to be uh, affiliated with it and, and also of course with the IBF who helped to organize it. Um, as you said in your introduction, Jan, what I want to do today in, in the next about 20 minutes is um, paint on a broader canvas, um, walk up on the hill and look around what we know from uh, both from economic theory but also from uh, past uh, crises, disasters, uh, wars about the uh, debt dynamics and the cost of these uh, great events and um, one, if there's one question that if you open the newspaper these days around the world, it's very often, uh, can we afford this? Uh, governments have stepped in with um, um, big uh, rescue plans uh, around the world. And um, the question uh, lingers on many people's minds, is this something that uh, we're doing too much? Can we actually um, pay for this down the road? And how, how, do we, how do we think about the way forward from here? having um, supported the economy and still having to support the economy uh, so much. So let me, uh, first of all, um, see if I can uh, share my screen. So you have some uh, slides to share, uh, to look at while I talk. I hope this uh, worked. Jan can, yeah, it, it looks at it. Moritz, Moritz can, I, can I just interfere for one second? Yes. Because I forgot to announce something which is important for the, for the course of our seminar. You want participation and we want to invite participants to use the questions and answers uh, or Fragen und Antwort button uh, in your program on your screen. And if you have questions, please type them down and I will see them and I will read them and you can, as a people in the audience, you can vote on questions that you see already. So you can vote them up, basically. I look at that and I will then pose on your behalf, on participants' behalf, um, the most uh, highly voted questions to Moritz later on. Thank you very much. Sorry for intervention. So Moritz. Wonderful. Yes, let me let me continue. So the um, the question that, as I mentioned, is on in many people's minds these days is how can we? How do we pay for it? Can we afford this? Or in German, can we uns das alles leisten? Um, so let's take uh, let's go right into it. Um, can we afford it? Um, I think to the, the best starting point to look at this question is is, is frankly to say um, what is happening now is almost a textbook economic textbook shock. Uh, we have this moment where for uh, reasons of um, you know, really of survival and medical emergency, um, our, economy, our economy is in a free state. And despite the fact that we can't produce and our economy is, 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 is down, we want to stabilize our income. And there is an old and time-tested way to deal with such catastrophes, namely we borrow from the future. And that's what we're doing right now. We, um, many governments around the world are, are having uh, legislating big um, fiscal programs that are to a large extent debt financed. So the first question then to ask is, where do we actually get the money from? And the answer is uh, clear to many who are in the fields of, of, of macroeconomics, but um, um, always slightly um, confusing for people who don't think about this, but th the fact is that we um, get the money largely from ourselves. So uh, we sit at home right now and we can't spend our money and um, we might still have some income and it ends up in the bank. Um, and the bank typically in a normal economy passes it on to companies who want to invest and grow their business. But currently, very few companies do that. Uh, they struggle with other quest problems. So what do uh, the banks do with our money? Well, one, reason, one option is, and they're doing this in, uh, in large numbers, is to pass our savings on to the government that then spends it from, for us. Um, that means, in a way, we are both creditors of the government, but also pay the taxes with which the government then um, services the debt. So we are both, in a way, uh, debtors and creditors of our state. We also borrow from foreigners. Um, and that is an important point, uh, which I will come back in a second, namely foreigners in these uncertain times, um, in the middle of the crisis, there are many people around the world who um, desire, who want to invest in what is called uh, a safe asset. And a safe asset means that's an asset that still pays when everything else doesn't. Um, so there's a big, um, typically in crises, and we know that from financial history, 
um, in crises like that and for a long time after, um, people, households and, and investors around the world uh, really seek safety. There is a flight to safety and uh, that comes in quite handy uh, for Germany, uh, as I will say in a minute, um, because Germany is one of the big uh, producers of safe assets in the world economy, along with a couple of other um, governments that have that status as being um, able, because of the credibility of the economic policy, the solidity of their finances, to produce um, assets, i.e. to um, give out bonds um, that uh, people buy that are considered nearly risk-free. Um, so how much can we borrow? Um, uh, if that's the framework, where do we stand uh, from a German perspective? Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, owing to these factors that I just mentioned, first that we uh, that Germany is one of the providers of safe assets in the world economy, but also uh, given that the population, that Germans itself tend to save a lot and these savings need to go somewhere, that the German government has quite a lot of fiscal space. So Deutsche Bank research uh, recently calculated in a study that uh, government debt in Germany might increase by 50% of GDP if you include all the guarantees. Um, hopefully not all of these guarantees will be drawn. So I think it's more realistic that we'll end up in a, in a range of around 80% of GDP as the debt to GDP ratio when um, this crisis is hopefully over, when we have a vaccine or some treatment, that means we can go back to normal. So having that long-term perspective, looking uh, from the top of the hill around uh, past episodes, first question would be 80% of GDP, is that a safe level? And the answer is quite clearly yes. Um, just to give you a comparison, the Industrial Revolution in the, in the United Kingdom and Great Britain in the 19th century um, uh, proceeded at a moment in time when debt to GDP after the wars with Napoleon was 200%, um, and the government was much smaller and had much less money to, uh, much less tax revenue to service that debt. Um, the post-World War II boom in the US, which in these days is often referred to as the golden age, not only in Europe, but also for American um, um, growth, um, occurred at a time when US debt to GDP was 120%. So comparing to that 80%, by all means, you know, we have the Maastricht level of 60%, so we would be slightly above that. But um, compared to past big disasters, crises, moments in, in history, we are starting into this post-corona world, hopefully at a level that is um, safe by most standards. But it's also true that eventually we must stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. It can't grow indefinitely. And that's the um, little bit of the economics part that I want to run you through because it gives you a nice framework. It's not gonna be very mathy, but it gives you a framework uh, kind of a model um, 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 to think about where we had it. So first of all is that um, we tend to look at debt sustainability um, through the lens of the debt to GDP ratio. So we're not looking at debt and if you open the papers you will often read about um, you know record debt levels in Germany but these are nominal numbers and they're not scaled, they're neither scaled by inflation nor they're scaled by GDP. So why do we look at the debt to GDP ratio, not just at um, debt outright? Well, that's because debt is being is serviced is, is, um, by the government with taxes and that's the, the tax base is, the, is, the, is what makes um, the, the, what enables the government to take on debt in the first place. And that tax base that we use to service um, the, the, the debt with growth with GDP, more or less. So it's important to look at a situation uh, to scale debt and, and debt service ability with GDP. Um, that almost immediately raises, um, raises two more issues, namely debt to GDP has two components. There's a numerator, namely debt, that's determined by how much we spend and borrow. And there's also a denominator, which is GDP. And GDP, the output of an economy, what we produce in a year or uh, any given time, is determined by many things and um, it grows with the overall growth rate of the economy. Um, and obviously these two are, we think of them as, in the, as, as being the numerator and the denominator, but they're not independent of each other. And um, we have spent quite a lot of time in the past decade to debate in macroeconomics, that is, to debate how these two are related. There's the debate about, this is the debate about austerity 
and the fiscal multiplier. So that's the question. If um, we draw down debt, if we reduce debt, if we um, cut down government spending or raise taxes, what does that do to GDP? So is austerity good or bad for growth? Um, and on the other hand, there is the debate about if the government takes money today, uh, finances it by debt and spends it, what is the multiply effect of that um, on the economy? Um, does it help the economy to grow more uh, quickly? So these are two questions that you need to keep in mind. They're not independent of each other. And we can bring down the debt to GDP ratio over time um, through both attacking sort of the numerator, bringing down debt, or um, growing um, the base, the tax base with which we can service the debt, um, i.e. with GDP growth. And these two will be important in just a second to understand what options there are going forward for Germany. So here's the mathy part of this presentation. It's the so-called law of motion for the debt to GDP ratio. It looks a little bit um, complicated maybe for some, but it's a very uh, simple way or very intuitive way uh, of framing the issue. The, this equation simply tells you on the left hand side is debt to GDP today, the debt to GDP ratio today is determined by the debt to GDP ratio last period, that's debt over GDP at T minus one, which you see that the second component. And then there is this term in front of it, which is uh, one plus the interest rate on debt divided by one plus the growth rate of the economy. So that's the famous R versus G differential, the difference between the interest we have to pay on our debt and the growth rate of the economy, the growth rate with which the tax base of the economy grows. And we will see that this, dif this differential, this um, relationship between taxes and growth is a very important one. And it's one where right now in the situation we're in, uh, we are kind of lucky um, because um, interest rates on debt globally, not only in the Eurozone and not only in Germany, are, are relatively low, very low by historical standards. And uh, growth rates post-corona are likely to be, you know, going back to some long-run uh, normal state. And that relationship um, will turn out to be quite beneficial for debt ratios. And I'll come to this in a minute. There are also two other um, parts in this, or two other um, arguments in this equation, namely the primary balance, uh, which is effectively fiscal policy. That means, like, what is our deficit? Um, if we exclude the interest payments on the debt, because the interest is already covered on the, in this R versus G differential. And then there's something that I call the X factor. Uh, the X factor is all kinds of one-off measures uh, that can occur in a given year. For example, we could privatize a big company or we could, um, or we could have external debt. And if the exchange rates change, um, our external debt could become more or less valuable. But for the time being, I think we can ignore this X factor. The X factor is only important because you hear often in the recent debate that we might need a new burden sharing agreement, a new Lastenausgleich, um, as we we have seen in, in 1952 in Germany to take care to to deal with the post World War II um, uh, burden. So that that's a little bit the, the way, the, a good way to frame um, the issue. Namely, do we can we if we want to reduce debt to GDP going forward after this spike uh, in, in 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 currently? Um, one of these factors will have to play its role. And some would say um, we need uh, some new some one-off factor that could be. Um, we had one also in the London debt, debt agreement in 1953, where the uh, the debt of the young uh, federal republic was uh, significantly reduced. So, but the, you, this allows you to frame the question as, can we rely on the debt dynamics, the interest growth dynamics going forward to reduce the debt again? As I said, the debt cannot, debt to GDP ratio cannot grow indefinitely. We will have to stabilize it at some point. Or do we need to adjust the primary balance? Do we need to tighten our belts fiscally going forward? Or do we need to rely on some one-off factor that could be a new Lastenausgleich, a wealth tax, or um, large-scale privatization, or other measures? Um, so to give you an illustration, um, I've taken this from, a, uh, from an IMF presentation, um, is to give you a sense that in this current predicament, and I'll show you some historical data in a, in a minute, um, that there, these, this, the differential between GDP growth and, and the interest rate, you can think of it almost like a hot air balloon. 
So if interest rates are uh, greater than GDP growth, the debt to GDP ratio tends to grow, the balloon goes up. If interest rates are below GDP growth, the debt to GDP ratio, without doing anything, changing anything in that equation, tends to go down. So if you will, GDP growth is like the sand in the back, it helps to bring the debt to GDP ratio down. Well, the interest rate is like hot air, it pushes the debt to GDP ratio. Um, so let's look at some historical, and I mentioned already the, the UK debt to GDP ratio of around 200% after the Napoleonic Wars. Let's look at some historical episodes of um, where debt to GDP ratios were reduced significantly. One of the most famous of these episodes is the 19th century uh, experience in in Great Britain, in the, in the United Kingdom, where uh, public debt to GDP coming out of the wars with Napoleon was around 200%. And um, roughly 100 years later, at the time, um, at, on the eve of the First World War, debt to GDP had been reduced to uh, around 20, 25%. So how did this come about? And you see here two of these um, parts of the equation. You see public the public debt um, to GDP ratio, but you also see the primary balance. And you see that in the second half of this 19th century, the dotted line is consistently um, the dotted line is consistently positive. It's, res it's very high at the in the first half. It declines somewhat, but it stays consistently positive, meaning that the United Kingdom over the 19th century has run persistently uh, persistent primary surpluses. It has really tightened fiscally belts, achieved these surpluses, and repaid the debt. Yeah. So the, the famous episode in, in 19th century adjustment relied on that primary balance, on the fiscal policy um, factor, um, achieving surpluses to actually reduce the outstanding debt. We have a second famous episode, which is after World War II, where many countries, remember Germany um, after the war had a very generous uh, debt restructuring. So in a way, Germany defaulted on its debt or restructured its debt. So um, the debt to GDP ratio at the beginning of the uh, so-called economic miracle was uh, was relatively low, uh, but other countries came out of the Second World War with very high debt to GDP ratios, and they relied on a different mechanism to bring um, the debt to GDP ratio down, and it's one that is very relevant in the current um, um, at, uh, current uh, time as well, although with a slight uh, twist. So what you see here, if you zoom in on the period after World War II, you see that the um, interest growth differential. So the difference between um, the growth rate of the economy and the interest rate on public debt, remember that air balloon that goes up or down, was persistently negative in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. You see, and, and for some time, uh, it was quite um, heavily negative, actually, below, uh, below zero. Uh, how was this done? Well, at the time, this was done by effectively controlling credit markets and financial markets um, and keeping interest rates in these markets below the growth rate to um, get rid of or to reduce the debt to GDP ratio um, in a situation where probably without that financial repression, as it's called, um, interest rates would have been higher. Um, I'm showing you this because we right now are in a situation, again, where the interest rate is um, and was for quite some time already in the past decade um, below the growth rate of the economy. Um, and that's, you know, arguably without us um, resorting to similar um, financial repression as it was done in the 50s and 60s. The reasons for this structural phenomenon are much debated. Some call it secular stagnation, some point to uh, demographic trends, others point to inequality as a, as a reason why interest rates have fallen so much. But to the degree that we are and remain in this low interest rate environment, um, a very similar mechanism going forward could be at work in the in the future going forward from here, as we've seen in the 50s, 60s and 70s, namely a favorable differential between interest rates and growth that allows us to reduce debt to GDP um, going forward, even without um, going 19th century style, going British um, by achieving these large fiscal surpluses. Um, let me um, just give you one um, quick uh, regression result here, which I think is a very interesting one, um, because it tells you a lot about uh, the fact that democracies 
uh, that often have a bad press. Um, and in Germany, uh, there is the Schuldenbremse, which is partly um, a way of um, sort of addressing what is often called the deficit bias of, of democracies. Uh, so the idea that it's always easy for parliaments to take on a lot of politicians to take on a lot of debt and give it to uh, future generations to pay it back and consume it to, to consume today. This table shows you is a simple test whether uh, modern democracies, and these are um, the democratic countries um, that we typically speak of in the OECD world over the long run, whether, they, whether these democracies actually adjust their primary balances, i.e. whether they adjust their fiscal stance, their fiscal policy, when debt to GDP goes up. So that's a very simple test in a way. So imagine a situation when public debt to GDP, public debt to GDP ratio goes up, do countries adjust their primary balance, do countries adjust their fiscal policy to prevent that debt to GDP ratio from rising further? And what these positive coefficients here tell you in the first line is that indeed we find in the long run data a significant response of, um, of fiscal policy to rising GDP. What this means in short is that democracies are actually better than their uh, then better than their reputation, parliaments adjust fiscal policy when debt to GDP goes up. And um, there is a mechanism inbuilt into modern democracies that representation and taxation actually work in the sense that we adjust when things threaten to become unsustainable. Okay, let me come to the end. Where could, what should we do here? And um, I have a couple of slides about Europe, but maybe we bring those up in the, in the discussion later. Um, my summary at this stage and my outlook is uh, we don't need the X factor here. Um, um, some people are talking about the need for a new Lastenausgleich in Germany or a wealth tax. Um, given the situation that I've just described to you, that A, we have enough fiscal space, our debt to GDP ratios are in a range that by any historical standard must be considered safe. Um, you know, safe institute and safe debt levels here. And um, that also given the low interest rates that we currently have in the world economy, German Bund yields are at roughly minus 50 basis points. So they're negative. Investors are paying the German government to uh, store money effectively for them. And there is no reason to um, um, think that we wouldn't come back to real growth rates in the one to 2% range when things are when things are over, maybe a little lower than in the past decade, but still positive, so that this rate growth differential will stay very favorable. What that means in a nutshell is um, we can, we do not have to go to uh, the UK 19th century experience of running these very high fiscal surpluses. We are lucky in a way that um, current savings investment trends in the world economy put us in a situation where um, we will, because that rate growth differential is so favorably, where we will grow out of our debt in an environment of low rates, even without uh, making uh, large efforts um, to run surpluses. So um, currently for the, in the German debate, we are poised to return to the Schuldenbremse regime when the emergency situation is over, um, going back to where we, where we were before, um, if we can do that in a way that doesn't harm growth, we'll take care of most of our public debt to GDP um, dynamics going forward. Keep in mind, though, when we and we will come to that discussion in Germany relatively soon when we when 2023 approaches and um, we will discuss again, should we come back to the uh, black zero or not? Um, we should take into account that what the next generation cares about is not just how much debt we give, we leave them, it's also how much richer we are. So um, just to make a very simple point, when debt to GDP is 20% and our GDP is 10 billion, we are poorer than in a situation where debt to GDP is 50%, but the GDP is 20 billion. Um, so um, in a way, um, the sort of the, the, the magic want here is to come to a regime where we can stabilize and bring down the debt to GDP ratio in the future again in a growth friendly way. And uh, frankly speaking, uh, what we've done in the last decade in the Eurozone outside of Germany uh, was not very successful in 
addressing both parts of the um, of the equation, namely bringing down the debt to GDP ratio while sustaining growth. And part of the problem, uh, part of the problems that we're discussing now in Europe, result from that point that uh, both the numerator and the denominator are important for uh, GDP for debt to GDP ratio. So, and this brings us to the European dimension. Uh, my final word um, here would be that while I think you've taken the bottom line of my presentation is that um, we don't have to be all too worried about the uh, public debt to GDP situation in Germany um, uh, currently, but not all countries in Europe have the same fiscal space. Uh, this creates a risk of highly asymmetric responses to Corona across Europe. I think that's the macroeconomic crux of what we're discussing right now, that you know, if it makes sense to have these bazookas and debt and protect and protective shields in, in Germany, it also makes sense to have them in Italy, but not all countries might be in a position to afford them, which would then create an asymmetric um, recovery across Europe, which ultimately would also harm the German economy. So in an ideal case, in a textbook world, we could all come together and find out together that we can kickstart the European economy and avoid and catch these externalities um, that uh, we get if Italy recovers quickly. Um, there is a warning sign here from the last crisis where the European recovery lagged behind other countries and uh, we've seen the um, economic but also the political consequences of that and so the European summit tomorrow will be very important in, in, um, in, in preparing a, a uh, recovery in Europe that um, captures the externalities that everyone, all the countries, can uh, do the economically uh, right things. And uh, I'll leave it here and, and hand back to, to Jan. So thank you, Moritz. That was really exciting. And uh, I think it's also, in a certain way, in um, let's say, gives us a bit of uh, peace of mind, what you are saying, so we can face the current situation and we may come out of it um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a safe way. So we will touch on the safe assets. I've looked at the questions. Many questions have been coming in and some have been voted up. So I, I try to follow a bit the voting decision because that's the way everybody has a say on what will be discussed. And uh, the very, um, I, would, I would start with was saying what Bavaria 13, whoever that is, <laughs> has been asking and which has been voted high up. Um, that's basically the question whether what you are saying about Germany, which is uh, reassuring in a certain way, may not be true for all other countries. And if we take a slightly broader view and maybe just walk over the Alps and ask us, so what's, what would be your view on Italy? And maybe then going from there, maybe on, on Europe as a whole, um, that would be basically the, the, the first question I would like to put up to you. Great, thank you. So let me come back to uh, my presentation and um, show you one slide that um, might um, clarify a little bit where we stand. This looks complicated, but it's exactly a, um, an attempt to help you and it helped me and, and, and some others to think through the issues that are on the table right now and also on the table for the European Council tomorrow. Uh, these are pretty much the, the different the decision tree or the algorithm that uh, we have worked through over the past weeks. So the starting question at the top is, will Italy be able to implement the necessary stabilization policies on its own as long as it, Italy has access to financing? And we can talk, Italy is just a placeholder, but I think it's, it's on many people's mind as the country that um, has the most, was hit very badly, unfortunately, by, by Corona and uh, where debt to GDP ratios are high and, and, and we need to, and then the question is, how do we go forward from here? So there is two issues. The first is, and that was the initial reaction in, in many capitals in Europe, oh, this is just a liquidity issue. And if it's just a liquidity issue, you answer that question positively. You say, yes, as, as long as Italy has access to liquidity, and can go to financial markets and borrow, then Italy can deal with the aftermath of Corona and kickstarting the economy uh, on its own or on her own. Um, and there are two options. One is the, the so-called PEP program of the of the ECB, where you know the, the ECB will has announced that it would support uh, government bond markets. 
or there's an institution that we founded after the last crisis, which is the ESM, um, that allows countries against some conditionality and some um, and some uh, rules and, and some you know um, things they have to accept to borrow relatively cheaply. The key assumption, if you want to go that tree and you say that like, this is how I think about the world and um, um, and this is you know where until two weeks I think the debate in Europe and in, in Berlin and different capitals was, the key assumption here really is that all that's needed is liquidity. Italy is solvent, it Italian debt to GDP can and will increase and that's still okay. Um, I'm not taking a stance, I'm just saying this is, these are the assumptions that were made. If you've gone to the right-hand side, there's a different assumption. And that assumption is that Italian debt to GDP cannot increase one for one with the money or the deficits, the money that Italy uh, spends to fight Corona. Um, so that means that we need some, that some kinds of transfers is needed, i.e. the money given to Italy coming from whatever source that Italy can spend without it being recorded as debt on the Italian government's balance sheet. Um, so uh, effectively, that means transfers would be needed. Italian debt to GDP will increase by less than what Italy receives. That is the tree of the debate that we're in now. Um, where we're saying like, oh, no, it's not just a liquidity issue. Um, if we just treat it as a liquidity issue, there is a danger that Italy won't be able to do enough or will not do enough um, ex ante because of a debt constraint that is too close for Italy to be comfortable with. So they will do less than what would be macroeconomically optimal. So if you think that's true, then you need to, you want to set up some kind of support mechanism. And then um, we are at the third level here. Um, then the question is one about financing. And uh, you've all heard about Corona bonds and um, ideas to issue joint debt to do that. That is, to be honest, not the only way to do that. It's, there's some macroeconomic and financial reasons to, uh, that this might be the preferable way, um, but it's not the only way. We could also say as Europeans, we all pay 5% of GDP into some big pot, a Corona fund, um, and we raise the money nationally via taxes or via borrowing or by cutting other expenditures. And then these 5% of GDP go into a big Corona fund, which is administered by the commission or some European agency. And that Corona fund pays the excess health expenditures in Italy and helps to kickstart the economy after the Corona crisis is over. We could do that. And I think there's nothing, you know, Germans like the idea of Ordnungspolitik, of like having proper rules. I think there's nothing wrong with this. The parliament would just say, uh, we put one off 5% into such a Corona fund. Obviously you could do the same also you'd say like, oh, that Corona fund could also borrow in financial markets, one off 5% of GDP. It's clear ex ante how much money that would be. It's 5% of GDP or a number that we decide. And it's one off and either we all guarantee it jointly or we give some tax revenue to the European Commission or some other European entity um, with which that entity can service the debt. So now we're in the bottom right corner where the EU, the Commission issues Corona bonds uh, that are either guaranteed by the member states or that are serviced by some transfer of taxes or resources from the member state to Brussels which are then used to uh, backstop this new debt. People have, for example, talked about the, um, the revenues from the emissions trading scheme, which is a European scheme. And you could say like, you know, these, the revenues from that European scheme should actually come up at the European level. And that would work out reasonably well, given that interest rates are low. Um, the other option is we don't do this. It's not the commission that borrows jointly, but the individual member states. But this raises a lot of issues of, um, you know, um, incentives, more of, of questions of governance that are not as easy. And I think what's on the table now um, is the Spanish proposal um, that came out in the past couple of days. That is exactly that bottom right corner uh, where um, the EU Commission would issue debt, maybe a trillion, maybe less, maybe more. We don't know. Um, and there's an idea even to have perpetual debt, so debt that never has to be paid back. Um, that would, and the interest on that debt, the debt service would come out of a new resources, potentially emissions trading revenues or others that would be given to the commission. And this fund then, this trillion euros would be there to support 
countries according to need, not according to financial ability. And I think, I mean, I've been reasonably vocal about this. I think uh, this is a moment, um, this is a shock for which no one can be blamed. It's, corona is no one's fault. So all the usual questions about moral hazard are much less pertinent. Um, I think this is economically and um, politically, there's a very strong case to tackle this jointly uh, on the European level. Um, if I may just intervene, Moritz, Please. because the, the most highly voted question is closely related to what you said, and they would like to, it's, it's Jan Rademacher is, takes the lead here. Are you in favor of Corona or Eurobonds? So I interpret your answer that you would say yes. It's all a matter, of course, of how it is uh, in the end designed, but in general, that's the way to go. Yes, I would. Um, I mean, uh, uh, my personal opinion, and, and let me state this um, very clearly, is that um, the advantages of, I think we need a European response, and we could do that by increasing our budget contributions to Brussels one-off, or we could say we borrow one-off these corona bonds. And under the following conditions, I would be in favor of corona bonds, um, under the condition that it's limited, it's one-off, and there is no implication whatsoever that um, um, individual member states take responsibility for the legacy debt of other countries. So this is really, and this is the only way, by the way, this is possible under the EU treaty, on the Article 122, says in cases of emergency, natural catastrophes, etc., we can give financial aid to each other. Uh, but it's a one-off limited mechanism that is not going to be an institutional feature and that does not imply any um, German or Belgian or Dutch responsibility for the legacy debt of Italy. So this idea that is often conveyed in the German media that somehow this is the beginning of, you know, the German taxpayer being responsible for all the Italian borrowing is simply wrong. This would be a one-off mechanism and I would be in favor of doing it via bonds for two reasons. One, I think economically, it's a very bad idea to increase taxes now. So given where interest rates are and where the interest rate growth differential is, there is, um, a, very, uh, is a window of opportunity to do this at very low interest rates. And B, and this is something that, that Jan and others have worked on in the past, and, and me too, um, what we are lacking in Europe and what is a crucial ingredient for financial stability uh, would be a European safe asset. And um, having a trillion euros of corona bonds outstanding that are, that are safely financed by, say, the emissions trading revenues at the European level or guaranteed by the member states would provide the European banking system and the European financial system with such a safe asset that could have very positive externalities for financial stability uh, down the road. And um, that would from my personal opinion, be the key argument, um, these two key arguments for um, one-off corona bonds uh, now uh, that allow us to raise substantial amounts of money in a situation where savings rates are extremely high because none of us can spend the money at very favorable interest rates and, and literally save the European uh, Monetary Union and make sure we get out of this uh, crisis quickly and, and importantly together. Yeah, thank you. That was helpful. I, I just uh, in, can imagine, uh, uh, let's say, a number of uh, uh, further questions that follow on this corona issue. Um, and I, it's certainly, I think, a good idea to have more discussion on that. So I, I will not go into this any deeper because we have so many more questions. But I, one question I want to mention is, you said it should be a one-off event. And I mean, how do we make sure that this is a one-off event, right? So that's something, not, it's not easy for uh, policymakers to tie their hands that this is the only time they do it and they don't do it tomorrow uh, just as the year before. In any case, I would like to come to a, a second area where a lot of questions um, are being uh, Can I say posed. one thing, Jan, because that, yeah. that one of the questions is indeed very important. And I agree with you, the political economy, you know, we've seen so many one-off measures that turn out to be permanent. In this case, I'm not worried for the simple reason that the treaties are very clear. We cannot bail out other member states. We cannot do that unless 
we go by Article 122 of the treaty, which is, states very clearly in case of a natural emergency, natural catastrophe. So, I mean, you might say like, oh, maybe we come up with a natural catastrophe every year, but I, I doubt that. So, you know, in, in these big, we really need a natural catastrophe. We say like there's a member state in deep, deep uh, problems for reasons that are beyond the member state control. So wouldn't, you know, just like the Italian government passing a budget that has a like, like big deficit would not qualify. So in that specific case, because Article 122 is so specific, about the need to have a natural catastrophe for this mechanism to be invoked and possible to be invoked. I'm a little less worried. I think, um, yeah, but maybe leave it here. But that's there was supposed to be a quick answer. Yeah, I, I, I would continue with one, let's say, technical question, which you probably can answer very, very quickly. But since it has a lot of votes, I want to mention it. And that is, what is the role of inflation in your scenarios. So you, you showed us the relationship between interest rate and growth rate. And the, the real question then is, was that interest rate real interest rate or nominal interest rate that is including the inflation or excluding the inflation? Yes, all the, the, um, the uh, equations I showed you like, were in real terms. So it was the real interest rate and the real growth rate. Um, the idea would be that even if there is a temptation for governments to inflate, the nominal interest rates would also adjust. So what matters in the end is the, is the real interest rate, i.e. the differential between inflation rates and, and, and nominal interest rate. And that is, I mean, currently, you know, the ECB has been very, very successful. You would probably say too successful in keeping price stability. We, there is a, a target of close to 2%. And in the past decade, we uh, were consistently below that. So there was, in a way, too little inflation, if you will. Um, but um, so we have inflation rates between 1% and 2% going forwards. And nominal interest rates are around zero, or even negative. We have negative real interest rates around 2%. That, and this is the point, this, which we could lock in now. Um, maybe that's a good moment to talk briefly about that Spanish idea of having a perpetual bond to finance that, um, because that also brings us to the 19th century. Actually, the way uh, Britain um, financed her empire and, and, and reduced its debt was by a perpetual debt. Uh, perpetual debt is debt that, is never be, that is, has never to be repaid. And the Spanish proposal that's on the table for the European Council now also says, like, why don't we have perpetual debt of a trillion euros? Um, realistically, we need to pay about one, one and a half percent interest on that. So that would be 50, 10 to 15 billion euros a year. Um, but remember, we never have to pay back. Um, so what we have to do each year, we have to come up with 10 to 15 billion. And the, I mean, I think the, the economic beauty, if you will, of that proposal is that right now we could lock in negative real interest rates, that differential between inflation and nominal interest rates on that perpetual debt forever. So we could in a way today borrow a trillion dollars, uh, euros, and never um, pay, uh, sort of re have real resource, real resource interest cost servicing that debt. So from an economic point of view, I think there's a lot to like about this idea. Um, and um, the, um, it would also, you know, have all these benefits in terms of providing a safe asset to the to the um, to the European banking system. Um, but it is um, an idea debt that has never that has to be never to be paid back is an idea that is not very easily communicable. So I hope that uh, a light goes off in the Chancellor's office in Berlin, and they see the economic uh, advantages of such an arrangement. Um, but, um, you know, there's also a view out there like perpetual debt is the most evil because it's never paid. Yeah. Yeah, okay, this, this sounds a bit like uh, magic, right? yeah. like a free lunch. And as a financial economist, you are typically very skeptical when something okay. comes completely free. So <laughs> that's also another area of very nice discussion that we could, uh, uh, could follow up here. Um, and it, it leads me a, a bit to the, to the safe asset part of um, potential questions. So I have two, two areas I would like to touch on next. One is on the safe assets and the other is on, on questions of equality or inequality. So on, 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 on safe assets, that would relate to what you just said about, um, about this perpetual bond. The perpetual bond 
of course, is very, I would say, uh, sensitive to interest rate changes. And as long as interest rates stay very, um, and, and to nominal interest rate changes, right? So unless they are all very stable, then of course, the value may be, may be relatively flat. But if interest rates move a lot, then perpetual bonds move maximum, have maximum uh, uh, movement there and make their safety uh, not so, so reliable any, anymore. But, in, but a, apart from this, the, the question that has been posed is, um, is, is it possible that um, we have situations in which even for Germany, the safety of its uh, debt is no longer unquestionable? And you made the case for 80%. Uh, GDP, the debt to GDP ratio. Um, uh, but what is if this number would reach higher levels, like 120? Or um, that is what uh, what uh, uh, Patrick is asking, even 200 mm -hmm. um, percent. I think there are two things to 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 say to this. First, um, of course, there are countries like Japan that have much higher debt to GDP ratios, and they don't seem to pose a problem. Uh, because um, it, Japan has its own central bank, the Bank of Japan, and the fiscal policy monetary coordination in these setups is different from the Eurozone. Because in Europe, um, we have pooled our monetary um, institute, well, our central bank. So in a way, for, for all the member states of the Euro, we, we don't have that same mechanism of cooperation that is possible in the US or in Japan or in other, in other countries since, you know, it's a different, um, it's not in the same country, not the same, not the same risk pool, if you will. Um, so that probably means that we have, um, that Japan is not a right yardstick. Um, and I would agree to that. Um, but um, the important part, and that's why I wanted to uh, present that law of motion for the debt ratio, the important thing is really the relationship between interest rates, real interest rates, and the real growth rate. Um, the problems in some countries, um, and we know that from the developing, development literature as well, but it might apply to some countries in the Eurozone as well, is if growth rates are really so low or stagnating that even with very low real interest rates, um, the debt dynamics deteriorate or at least don't improve. So I think that if you think about Italy for the past 15 years, the Italian economy has been in what you could maybe call a depression with very low growth rates. GDP per capita today is I think at the same level or even lower than 15 years ago. So if we fall into such a low growth trap, um, then the um, then in that case um, the uh, the quite favorable picture that I painted um, about basically as long as we have real positive growth between one and two percent and interest real interest rates stay at current levels and by the way we can borrow now and lock in these low interest rates for quite a while um, we should be okay if that changes I, I agree that then this law of motion also tells you. Um, that's a scenario where to achieve that sustainability, we will have to do um, either more, you know, come back to a black zero or even run surpluses, or think about other ways, one-off factors to reduce the debt, such as wealth taxation. But as I said, I think we're far away. I don't see a reason why the growth potential of the German economy um, has is not, um, you know, is is is, is still intact. Um, we have. We have great companies, um, you know, there's a, a, a climate transition coming um, that offers as many growth opportunities as it poses challenges. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist in terms with regard to um, growth going forward. I hope it gets greener, but um, that is not, doesn't mean that we're not gonna grow anymore. Yeah, okay, so I think you touched already on that issue. You said that to GDP ratios and particular particularly their dynamics differ across countries. Yeah. And so the, the, the general question posed by Jan, uh, which is not myself, um, is um, the, the, fa the question whether in the course of the crisis and after accumulating rescue programs for a while, will we see more inequality uh, either within country or even across countries? And that large last part of the question i would basically like to direct in in in, in view of europe as uh, like a north south divide or something like that is europe disintegrating 
on this growing on the debt dynamics or don't you think that this will happen and uh, of course the inequality question is also one that you can ask domestically are there so to speak those that fare better than others on uh, in in such a situation and can you predict anything here i think let me start with the european dimension because i think that is that is the more urgent and and and, and the one that's on the table now uh, i clearly see the risk that different fiscal space or differences in fiscal space and differences in um, fiscal capacity could translate into a very uneven recovery. So if it's Italy or Spain are not in the position to support the economies, have much more severe recessions and um, have much um, less um, ways to um, kickstart the economy, to stimulate the economy when Corona is over, then divergence within Europe will increase. Uh, potentially we get what we've seen after 2008, lower, considerably lower growth rates in, in Italy or Greece or Spain or Portugal than in the north. And um, I'm personally very worried that we cannot afford another lost decade in these countries. We cannot afford it economically, we cannot afford it socially, we cannot afford it politically without doing grave damage to the European project. And, um, you know, we've talked about populism a lot in the past decade and all these political changes. Um, we can discuss for a long time how they're related to austerity and sluggish growth rates or not, but um, I would worry a lot if we do not find a common European answer to this crisis, which really is a crisis that is nobody's fault. I mean, you could in 2008-9, you could always say like, okay, maybe Greek fiscal policy wasn't all that sustainable and maybe some, you know, some belts had to be tightened. But this time, it's really a crisis that hits everyone. And uh, that is, um, we could turn it, we could turn a symmetric shock, if you will, into an asymmetric one, because there's difference in fiscal space. And then we'll, we'll be back in the dynamics and the bad dynamics um, that has, that have cost us very dearly since to, after 2008, because our economic recovery was so much slower and took longer than in other parts of the world. Um, so that's the European dimension. On the national dimension inequality, I um, have th given some thought, but it's, I think it's really complex to think about distributional implications of what's going on. You would have to think about distribution implications of these rescue programs, um, codes of, uh, like these, these short-term work permits and, and helps for, for enterprises. It is, it, is quite, um, it is quite complex to think about that. My hunch would be that this crisis, the corona crisis, more will act more like what have maybe wars done before in the past. They are, they are, they is, there's, there's an experience of social, let's call it interconnectedness, of solidarity. We find out that the, um, the person at the supermarket is really system relevant um, to keep us going under these circumstances. So if you look again into in, back in financial and economic history, you will see that it's often after these episodes where people experienced yeah, social solidarity or this interconnectedness and the relevance of even, you know, the delivery person, um, that social welfare programs have been expanded. The most famous case probably being the NHS in the United Kingdom after World War II, where this was sort of after that united experience of, of having the war experience, uh, you could no longer deny uh, universal health care. And so there is, I think, we'll see, I mean, there's, there's sort of the short-term question about the distribution impact of the rescue packages in the bigger political scheme again personal opinion i would say typically these um, natural catastrophes wars disasters are moments in which uh, societies come together and find ways to um, share the burden and 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 realize that um, also people who have maybe low wage jobs play an important role and um, redistribute a little more yeah, that is a, that's, the, that's what we all hope for. But there may also be a, a future where this doesn't happen and where the forces that separate, uh, that, that, that are more centrifugal in, in its, in its uh, operation may also be at fault. Right? So I think we, we have, unfortunately, it's the end of our time. But I think it was uh, a wonderful experience to, to listen to you and to hear your view on on these things that are all moving us quite a bit and uh, will certainly continue to do so. 
Um, I hope that uh, we have uh, in the future more opportunities to listen to you, to talk to you. And for today, I want to thank you very much without adding one uh, remark that I read repeatedly in the, in the mails. Uh, namely, people said, that's really interesting. Where can we read more of that? And the question is, is there a particular uh, paper or, or some accessibility to what you showed us that, that we can share with, with, with the audience? Yes, we can certainly share the slides. Um, and um, I think that people would be happy to hear that. Yeah, since, I, no, since I, didn't, no. I hadn't asked you before, Moritz, so no, I wanted no to problem. make it a little bit uh, modest so you can say no. <laughs> okay, no thank you very much. Thank no, you, you to thank the you. audience. Thank you. thank you for having me. It was me. fascinating. And uh, for everybody, uh, stay healthy and have a good day. And bye bye, Moritz. All the best to New York. Uh, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.